Larry English is president and co-founder of Centric Consulting, a management consulting firm that guides you in the search for answers to complex digital, business, and technology problems. Before Centric Consulting, Larry worked for a large international consulting firm out of college until he got burnt out at 25. He and his newlywed wife backpacked around the world as he tried to find his path in life, and he did. Shortly after returning home, he and his like-minded pals founded Centric with a focus on changing how consulting was done by building a remote company with a mission to create a culture of employee and client happiness. Today, Centric is a thousand plus person company with offices in 12 US cities and India. Larry is also the author of Office Optional, how to build a connected culture with virtual teams. Thank you for joining us, Larry. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So as a fellow adventurer and traveler, I'm curious, where's the favorite place that you went? Okay, well, that's like asking who your favorite kid is. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll group this into a couple of different categories. So uh, let's see. So pre-kids, my wife and I backpacked around the world. And uh, a few of the ones that we loved were uh, going on safari in the Serengeti, climbing Kilimanjaro. Uh, trekking in the Himalayas in Nepal, running of the bulls, the Tour de France, uh, bungee jumping and blackwater rafting in New Zealand and scuba diving in Bali. And then uh, we have four boys. So um, after kids, we've just kind of taken them wherever we went. Uh, but the so they can go anywhere. They're, you know, they love it. Uh, the problem is now, unless there's like a, a chance of death, they are not, they get bored. So um, some of the great trips that they've loved, uh, we went to this place called Brooks Lodge in Alaska where the, you just walk around with grizzly bears all day long. Uh, in Costa Rica, there's tons of adventure. There's just one place in the jungle and the only way to get to it is to whitewater raft into the lodge in the jungle. Uh, and then uh, we were on a lake in uh, Am the Amazon and we were canoeing and there's five different species of piranha. <laughs> and my kid's like dangling his hand in the water. I'm like, this is not good. And so then the final thing I would say is, um, is um, my wife and I got older and we can afford not to be intense anymore. Um, some of the mind blowing places that we've stayed, uh, one was in a hut over um, uh, in Bora Bora over the, you know, over the water, um, kind of one of those iconic images, a place called El Maha, which is in the UAE and uh, just north of Dubai in the desert, which is incredible, uh, Jade Mountain uh, in St. Lucia, and then the Oberoi in uh, Udipur, India, um, just a few examples. Yeah, I, I did a couple of those things and now I just want to do all of that, except for the piranhas one. That, <laughs> <laughs> I, I might use something else as bait, not my own body parts. But yeah, that sounds pretty epic adventures there. I love that. So another adventure that you did is when you got burnt out of corporate America, you started your own company. Was that scary? Was that intimidating? What was that like for you? Honestly, not really, um, because I think about risk differently. So I've read all the interviews of people that are at the end of their life. And, you know, one of the big regrets that they always have is they did not take enough risk and explore their passions. And I didn't want to make that same mistake. Uh, so when we we started Centric, um, just a few months later, 9-11 happened and the dot-com bubble happened. It was the worst environment in, um, in 25 years. And I remember telling somebody, yeah, I'm gonna start a company. And they're like, you are the biggest idiot ever. Uh, but I still wasn't too concerned. It's because I had this marketable skill set that I knew if it didn't work out, it was very recoverable. And we had a good business plan. But the key point I would make for anybody that's really considering an entrepreneurial career path is to position yourself to be able to take risk. Uh, so my wife and I kept our personal expenses low so we could afford to take a big swing. And I see a lot of people that have a great idea, but they get really comfortable and their expenses arise up, you know, up to their level of income and then they just can't do it. And so th the final thing I would say is I studied a bunch of entrepreneurs before I did it. I was trying to figure out what is the common attribute that all these folks have. And what it was is they were willing to take risk. And so if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be willing to at least, you know, go, go pull the trigger, go do it. Well, and how did you study those entrepreneurs? What did that look like for you? Is that reading their books? Is that, was it another method? Um, multiple things. So certainly those things. And then also I went and interviewed a bunch of entrepreneurs that I'd known had, that had grown their business. And I was, um, I asked them what mistakes they'd made along the way. 
Um, I, I went and talked to a bunch that had grown their business to hundred million. And it was interesting. Um, I remember doing that and thinking that's impossible. And, and, uh, and then, you know, we're a $150 million company now. And uh, I look back and I'm just blown away by that, but we went and we took the risk. Um, and so, you know, I looked at, it was interesting looking at all, all of these just around, some were smart, some, some were not, some were lucky. Um, some uh, had really deep expertise or somebody found this really creative place to exploit. All, I, I was like, well, that's different. That's different. That's different. But the one thing is they were willing to take risk. Perfect. Well, speaking of taking risk, you started your company and it was a virtual company. And this was almost 20 years ago. Why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, we were uh, we were trying to innovate. We were trying to create a company that hadn't existed before. We we're trying to get rid of all the bad stuff from consulting and keep all the good stuff. And one of those ideas that we came up with was um, if if we could allow our employees to work remote, we think they could be happier. Uh, because, you know, they could be more protective, they could do more time outside, you know, have more time to do stuff outside of work. And so that was one of the things that we innovated on one of the things that we tried. And uh, we did it. And you would think that there was, you know, a lot of objections, but really, you know, like clients were like, they never asked to come to our office. And employees, once they tried being virtual, they're like, this is really great. So we've known for 20 years that this is a great way to work, but nobody else realized it. And then all of a sudden, everybody's doing it now, or at least within the last couple of years. So you guys were all ready for this. I mean, it wasn't much of a transformation as far as that goes for your company. So the pandemic happened, you know, people use a different date, but let's say March uh, 13th of 2020, then that's a, I think that was a Friday, Friday the 13th. Uh, on Monday, we were 100% remote, didn't, you know, nothing changed, <laughs> didn't skip a beat. And so we were able to do that. And then we were able to work with our clients and show them also how to deliver remote. So we were really well positioned. And so year 2020, you know, we were nervous about it when it happened, but it turned out to be, um, we had some of our most, our highest record months in revenue uh, because we were so well positioned for it. Yeah, I think you're right that I think it was the March 13th. I think it was a Friday. I was supposed to, I'd celebrated my birthday with my sisters on the 11th. And I was driving to a conference that I was supposed to be a keynote speaker at back when we had these in-person conferences. And, and it, it, all of a sudden, the, the governor shut down the city and it just disbanded. So I went from driving to that conference to driving home to going into the quarantine. So yeah, it was that flip into this virtual side. Crazy to think back on that. Yeah, and so what I would say is what's interesting is so everybody's excited, like, Oh, okay. We're, you know, the vaccine's coming out, you know, it's almost the, you know, one year anniversary and we're going to be back to the way things are. All the data that we see is we're never going back to the way things are. Um, we expect that probably some estimates are 75% of companies are going to adopt a hybrid model. I think it's going to be a hundred percent because I think companies are not going to have a choice uh, because employees like it and only 4% of employees want to go back into the office five days a week. So if you don't offer it as a company, uh, your competitors are, and people are going to um, go to where they can work that way. Now, when you're talking about not going back to the way things were before, are you referencing specifically the virtual office space? Because your company does a lot with technology, cloud technology, uh, and there have been changes in that landscape as well. So not only remote work, but also there's been 10, a decade of change in a year. Um, and every industry is being disrupted because everybody's adopting a digital business model now. So, uh, you know, not only is it work from anywhere, but we kind of use the term doing business anywhere. So what we've seen is customers that were forced to use digital channels to interact with your company, they love it. And they're not going back. So, back. so as an example, it's like telehealth. Before the pandemic, uh, I'm on the board of a hospital. We could not get doctors to ever use a virtual health visit. And, uh, and, and patients didn't want to do it either. And then they did it. And they're like, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. This is awesome. And the docs were the same way. So every industry, you're seeing the same thing. And so all this technology change and, and all this moving to a digital 
optimized experience and moving everything to the cloud, it is transforming every industry. Uh, so everything is changing. Yeah. So speaking of serving on a board, sharing information, sharing your leadership insights, you've also recently written a book. What made you decide to do that? Yeah, so we could see the change coming. Uh, all the things that I just talked about, you know, being able to work from anywhere, companies were becoming more accepting of it. People wanted to do it. Uh, the gig force was starting to develop. And so we could see this as the future of work. We just thought it was 10 plus years out. And so just trying to get ahead of the, the game. And since we've been doing it for 20 years, I would often speak to executives of company and I would explain how we were remote. We had a thousand people and we had a great culture and they would look at me like I was a crazy person. And so I was tired of people looking at me like I was a crazy person. And um, I kept having to explain it over and over. And I looked around, there was books on how to be remote, but there weren't books on how to be remote and have a great culture and keep everybody connected for the long term. And so I was like, okay, there's, you know, there's an area for me to write about. And so um, decided to do it, told my main partner about it. He's like, this is a dumb idea. Don't do this. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it was like a labor of love, nights and weekends. And then I, right around that March 13th, I was getting ready to publish it. And the pandemic happened and all of a sudden, you know, everybody wanted to know how to do it. Everybody was curious about it. And my partner said, great idea. Okay, so what's the cliff notes here? How do you have a remote work culture that is a good culture? So the thing that I would say in the shortest way I can is the secret to being connected is building deep relationships with everybody in your company. And there are ways, it's it's all in the book, it's kind of a how-to guide, but the, there are ways to do that even when you're interacting virtually on a daily basis. You can build the same deep personal relationships as if you were physically in the office with somebody, but you got to do that. That's that's the key to staying connected. Can you give me an example? Because I could see somebody saying shenanigans when it's online, it just isn't the same thing. Sure. So uh, I'll give you a couple examples. So one, in an office setting, a lot of those personal interactions that happen are on the way into the conference room for a meeting. They don't happen in a virtual world. So you have to recreate them in the virtual meeting. And so we'll take the first, uh, you know, let's say five minutes of an hour meeting, and we'll just connect on a personal level with each other. And sometimes it's a scripted question uh, like if you could be a superhero, who would it be? And sometimes it's just on a personal level. And we want people to connect, you know, and get to know each other personally because you build um, trust with each other. Uh, we model vulnerability as as an, as an organization. And what I mean by that is when you you share with everybody what you're worried about and your concerns, it vulnerability is a shortcut to trust. And so if you're doing that you in a virtual um, environment and you're doing it the right way, you're going to trust and build a deeper relationship faster virtually. Um, and then you're going to build deeper connections. Yeah, that makes sense to me, especially what you're saying about vulnerability, because I think especially on the online forum, you want to make sure it's presentable, picture perfect, et cetera. And that idea of a leader being open to that would, would resonate with me. So thank you for that. So now that you've been running this company for almost two decades, you're also starting to invest in other companies as an angel investor. What do you look for in businesses that you invest in? So th this is just me personally. Uh, I've learned to invest in what I understand. And so that is technology mainly. Um, and I usually invest in SaaS technology businesses. And I have a checklist that I go through that I keep improving when I make mistakes. And it would be the normal stuff that you would think about like business model, ability to raise funds, ability to scale. And I have my own personal twist on it. But the most important thing that I would tell you that has been my experience is I need a, a great experienced person or leadership team um, to, to make the bet. So um, I've made some bets on brilliant people, but you know, let's say they're just out of college or very young and immature. Those have, for me, have not worked out very well. And the ones where it is a seasoned executive or executives that have been around the block and can really execute and pivot and adjust, it really has increased the odds. 
The other um, thing that I would say is, so my returns have played out exactly like a VC fund typically what, would. And so what, what that means is it's very hard. You can't predict which, is gonna, which one's going to do well and which one isn't. Uh, so ones I thought were going to for certain do well have not, and ones that I was skeptical about have killed it. Um, and so if you take an example of, let's say you make 10 investments, you're going to have one or two that just um, you know, have really big wins or big returns. More or not, more of them will be losers. And then you'll have a few that are kind of neutral, okay returns. And it's played out exactly uh, for, for me the same way. Let me hop back to the topic of the pandemic for a moment. What career reset opportunities do you think this pandemic created? So I personally believe this is in my 30 plus year career, this is the best environment ever. Um, if you wanna do a career reset, this is the best time. We are at this unique point in history where you can start a business, you can spin it up in the cloud, no infrastructure, no buildings, you can work from anywhere, you can hire people from anywhere. You're so nimble with such a low cost structure. Uh, and the, the thing that I mentioned earlier is every industry is being radically disrupted. So it's just creating this immense opportunity right now. And we're not going back like we were talking about before. So if you want to work from anywhere, if you want to be a digital nomad, uh, the whole rise of the freelance gig economy, especially for technology workers, is just getting bigger and bigger and companies are being more accepted and building that into. And so if you wanted to go work six months and go take six months off, that is available to you. And then just what we talked about before, the digital economy is creating this wide grouping of digital skill sets from creative to deep tech to marketing that everybody can participate along what they're great at. So it's just a great time uh, for, for anybody that's starting their career or wants to make a change. So there's two questions I ask at the end of every interview. What is a career reset moment that either you or someone else you know of has had that went from being a difficult time to a future investment? I would offer words of encouragement so often your darkest moment uh, when you're going through your worst times uh, can actually lead to your greatest successes. And that was certainly true for me. I was at a high flying publicly traded startup. I had a, a ridiculous amount of stock options uh, that were worth a lot, but you could see that the fundamentals were crazy. They just didn't make any sense. And you know the company was all about growing the stock price, not really about <laughs> solid business model. And then the dot-com bubble hit. So those options went to you know penny, fractions of penny overnight. I had to lay off a lot of people. Uh, I probably wasn't far off from being laid off. The company was close to bankruptcy. The consulting industry is decimated. You're in the valley of doom, right? There's, it's not any bleaker or darker. Uh, and, but it also represents a tremendous opportunity. So what do we do? We started a company. Uh, we started Centric. And we started it with a business model we, we thought was solid and based on really solid fundamentals with great values and uh, great culture. And uh, it, what happens in bad times is a lot of the existing players get really conservative. And so it allows for new entrants. And then also really great people that normally wouldn't be available become available. So all of a sudden, that terrible experience led to my best experience. And so anybody that's going through that, you know, I want to give them uh, hope and encouragement because all those lessons you learned in the bad times, they're going to pay off and it'll turn into a good thing. Mm, I love that message of encouragement. If people want more messages like that, what's the best way to follow you, Larry? Sure. Uh, so my personal website is um, LarryEnglish.net. And then I'm on Twitter, LK English, and then on LinkedIn at Larry English. Well, thank you for sharing your journey from your adventures internationally to what it's been like to go from a corporate setting, building your own company, and then investing in other companies. It's absolutely a pleasure talking with you, Larry. Oh, it was, it was super fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like below and also subscribe to see future episodes.